might just be the hardest game I've ever played in my entire life. And to 112% it, I'll trek through some soul-crushing worlds, scour every crevice for hidden items, defeat some of the most insane bosses I've ever encountered, and- Oh god, read through a comment section of Silk Song jokes, I am not strong enough. I 112%ed Hollow Knight. The game starts off, and I'm dropped off into this tutorial section, where I learn the basic controls. You know, jump, attack, guzzle down the souls of the enemies I've killed to heal myself, basic stuff. Yes, in this game, every time you whack an enemy, you get a little piece of this milky white fluid called soul in your soul vessel. This soul can be used on a heal spell called focus. I make my way through the basic challenges, and after going up this side path, I unlock my first charm, Fury of the Fallen. Charms are like these little trinkets you can equip that'll give you extra perks. After finishing out the tutorial block, I drop into the game's first town, Dirt Mouth. But with this place being more dead than the Power World's player base, I head down into the Forgotten Crossroads. Down here, I can purchase a map of the area from this guy who does not look like me, do not comment that, Cornifer. I head to the right and find this delightful little caterpillar called a grub. Unfortunately, he's on a ledge that I'm going to need some sort of movement upgrade to reach. But I convince myself I can use my sword to pogo jump off this little fly to reach it, which leads to me spending five minutes more embarrassing than the time Hideo Kojima checked out my YouTube channel. Soon after, I encounter the game's first mini boss, Beetle with Big Stick. This guy's attack pattern is incredibly simple. He just swings his big stick and sometimes sends a little shockwave to you that you can jump over. Oh my god, this pattern is dog easy, bro. You suck. I head back to Dirt Mouth and buy the best charm in the game, the compass, which will show our location on the map. This is a must in a game where the map looks like whatever this is. With that, I head into the first real boss of the game, the False Knight. This guy has the gimmick that when you hit him, you don't collect soul, meaning your healing throughout the battle is limited. But while he manages to smack me with his bulbous club more than I'd like to admit, I'm able to easily defeat him and grab the city crest and a ton of this game's money, Geo. Beating the knight also permits me access to the snail shaman's hut, and after ripping some hard zaza he gave me, I obtain my first spell, Vengeful Spirit. This uses our soul to shoot out a powerful white blast. I can use that to kill this armadillo thing, giving me a new charm, Soul Catcher, which I equipped instantly, as it gives me more soul every time I hit an enemy. And if you're interested in increasing your soul, or even your mind and body, you should subscribe to my YouTube channel. If you're here, it means you like 100% videos, and I've got a bunch of my channel and tons more on the way. If you subscribe, you'll see my videos in your feed, and you won't have to spend 10 minutes on your lunch break trying to find anything to fill the void before ultimately scrolling through the dead zone that is Reddit. So please just click subscribe. After obtaining the Vengeful Spirit, I can use my shiny new spell to clear out this guzma looking bug back in the entrance to the crossroads, permitting me into a stunning new area, Green Path. And let me tell you, when I die, if they aren't playing Green Path's music at my funeral, I might just straight up get out of the coffin because this is that masterpiece kind of sound. <gasps> um. Silk Song! I pick up the map for Green Path and save this grub before running to a stunningly handsome and amazing looking warrior who's been trapped in the jaws of this fly. After taking out the pest, we have the honor of talking to this ravishing hero named Zote. I'm a little confused as to how my boy boss king was defeated by something my walking Phoenix of a knight beat without getting hit a single time, but it probably has something to do with how sigma pilled and based he is. Afterwards, I unlock a stag station, which serves as the fast travel system in this game, save another grub, and then find this dress wearing beetle named Hornet, who challenges us to a fight. The first this phase is pretty easy, so here are the highlights. Shaw, 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 Adido, Hall. In the second half of the fight, though, she picks up the speed. Why do people never go all out in their first phase? Most of her attacks are pretty easy to dodge, just requiring well-timed jumps, with the exception of this yo-yo trick attack that catches me off guard a few times. But after a few more hits, we manage to defeat her, unlocking the Mothwing Cloak, giving us the ability to dash. Would it seek to break the seals? My controller is- can you guys see this? That is absurd. They cannot be undone. They must be undone. Let us sleep low, shall our lives to Yeah, I don't know what goes on in the story of this game, guys. I'm gonna be honest, I have no clue. I'm not even gonna really try and follow it. All I know is that Hornet is cringe and Zod is based. We head back to the Forgotten Crossroads to access a new area, the Fungal Waste. While I'm usually someone who likes completely exploring an area before moving on, I already know this video is going to take one million hours to record due to some certain brutally hard DLC content, so my goal is to beeline for as many movement upgrades as soon as I can. Otherwise, we'll be doing more backtracking than a Metroid Prime game. Deep in the Fungal Waste hides the location of our next upgrade, Mantis Village. Here, after weaving through some surprisingly tough enemies, we grab the Mantis Claw. This claw allows us to wall jump, and in combination with the dash, this explodes our movement options. Okay, boom, uh, uh, hit, hit, boom, jump, hit, jump, 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 jump. Dude, I'm the goat. But before we play with our new wall jump toy, it's time to take on the boss of this area, the Mantis Lords. And oh god. Now for reference, I have played this game before, but I really just played through the main story. And when I played, I remember resetting this fight for hours upon hours. And with less than two hours on this file, I was severely underprepared. But I decided to head in anyway. I'll probably get my 
cheeks clapped. I gotta remember the attack pattern. Hit, hit, jump, jump, hit, hit. Come on. See, the one is easy. The one I can always do. Oh, that was clean. I think the hardest part is knowing which way he's gonna throw his boomerang. Oh, crap, crap, crap. Okay. I managed to finish off the rest of the first lord without taking another hit. And now it's time to take on the other two at the same time. Oh, 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 oh crap, crap, crap. Oh my god, I can't believe I, I squeezed in a heal there. That was crazy. Oh crap, I tried to heal. That was stupid. Oh god, I'm not gonna get a first attempt at all. Think bad things only happen when I try and heal. I should just never heal. Okay, jump. Oh. Okay, I got a heal in. Nice. Oh, how did I get hit by that? That was stupid. That was just dumb. That was just dumb. I should have waited. I got nervous. I'm getting nervous. Oh! Oh my god, I got one! Okay, I healed, but then I instantly got hit, so it didn't matter. Come on, can we just get a heal in? Okay, we got a heal in. Come on, no way! Oh my god, first attempt! I am actually goaded! Oh my god, suck on that, mantis whatevers. Oh my god, yeah, bow to me. Bro, that feels incredible. Holy crap. And for besting that terrifying fight, we're rewarded with one of the best charms in the game, Mark of Pride. This greatly increases the range of our nail and makes the game leagues easier. But before we start putting this amazing charm to use, I'd like to tell you about the sponsor of today's video, War Thunder. War Thunder is one of the most complex vehicle combat games ever made, and it's completely free on PC and consoles. You can command tanks, planes, helicopters, or even ships from each of the 10 different main nations, leading to 2,500 historically accurate vehicles for you to pilot. They've got everything from biplanes and armored cars of the 1920s to the fighter jets and main battle tanks of today. The game prides itself on combat being incredibly realistic with authentic sound effects and graphics that really make you feel like you're a pilot of one of the most powerful war machines of any era. And new or returning players that haven't played in six months will receive a massive bonus pack when you sign up using my link. The bonus pack will give you the exclusive vehicle decorator Eagle of Valor, 100,000 silver lions, and seven days of premium account. And the game is available and completely free on PC, PlayStation, or Xbox. So what are you waiting for? Join a worldwide community of over 70 million players in epic PvP battles today and delve into the breathtaking experience that is War Thunder. With an unmatched wealth of high quality content discovered, there's simply no game better suited for fans of military history. The bonus pack is only available for a limited time, so make sure to sign up using my link in the pinned comment or description. And thanks to War Thunder for sponsoring today's video. From here, I head back through the fungal waste into this challenging thorn section, where I have to be more careful than when I tried to make BTS jokes on the internet. After making it through, we can insert the city's crest into the statue, permitting us access to the City of Tears. Now, I really just wanted to make a quick stop by here to visit the Nailsmith, who repairs our nail for 250 Geo, and effectively doubles our damage. On my way out, though, I accidentally trigger a cutscene. Oh, it's, it's raining black. That seems good. <gasps> Hornet! It's no surprise that you've managed to reach the heart of this world, and in doing so, you shall know the sacrifice that keeps it standing. If knowing that truth, you're still attempt- you'd still attempt to roll the Hollow Knight's Perpetuation, keep the grave in ash, and mark it as grant. Okay, yeah. Like, <laughs> game at all still. Any game cannot read dialogue. <laughs> and I still don't. I, I don't know the story of this game. I played through it like twice, and I still don't get what's supposed to be going on here. I, I still don't understand at all. It's, it's like there's a, there's a Hollow Knight. Everything beyond that is completely obscure to me. After ordering a couple cases of Hooked on Phonics, I leave the city, but on my way out, I sell some of these Hollow Nest seals I picked up to the Relic Seeker. Usually, I hold on to these until right before I want to buy something. But I haven't died this entire playthrough so far, so what could possibly go wrong? Zoot, my boy! More like Goat the Mighty, you know what I'm saying? You guys get it? I head back to Dirtmouth and buy the rest of the map supplies from the woman I am very scared to search on Reddit. My next major goal is to finish my movement upgrades by getting the double jump ability. But to get that, first we'll need another ability from an area called Crystal Peak, so I start making the trek there. But along the way, we run into the brooding Molek. Oh my god. Oh, you suck. I'm good. Oh, okay, he hit me. Just don't get greedy with my attacks. Woo! Woo! Oh, I went right into him. Okay. Oh, how did I get hit by that? All good. Oh my god, I can't believe I dodged that. Heal. Okay. Okay, T just take it slow, I think, is the thing. Oh, he's dead. Oh, that was easy. I thought you were gonna put up a fight, brother. 
And for beating that horrifying abomination, we're rewarded with a mask fragment. And if we manage to collect three more of these, we'll get a permanent health upgrade. But on the path to Crystal Peak, we encounter another mini boss fight in the Gruz Mother. However, this one is even easier. And after watching her children brutally rip through her stomach, haunting me for years to come, we encounter Sly, who decides to move to Dirtmouth as a shopkeep and will grant us access to Crystal Peak as well. But before visiting him, I stop by the nearby charm shop. Here I pick up the Shaman Stone, which will increase our spell's damage by 50%. This is going to be extremely helpful for our boss fights. I also purchased myself a Charm Notch, allowing me to equip more charms at a single time. I head back to the surface and buy the Gathering Swarm Charm, which will automatically pick up any Geo we find on the ground. But what I really came for was the Luma Fly Lantern. This will allow me to see in otherwise dark areas. With the Lantern at our disposal, we can now access this area through the crossroads. And after paying a 50 Geo toll, are permitted into the Crystal Peak. I explore around for a bit before coming across this pit, but even with my dash, I can't make it across, sending me down into a new area called the Palace Ground. Here I get a short cutscene that says I need to find and slay all three dreamers to gain access to the vessel. But more importantly than some confusing lore I'll never understand, we get this mythical looking sword called the Dream Nail. We wake up and a bug named the Seer tells us we need to use the Dream Nail to collect as much essence as possible. We can get this essence from these little trees here or by finding these warrior graves scattered around the map and then challenging them. This one, Zero, has two swords that he launches at us. He's honestly pretty easy to dodge until he started studying the worst Legend of Zelda games and gets four swords. Now he's got four, that's not good. Now he's got four, that's not good. Irregardless of his swords, I managed to not take a single hit in the fight and finish him off for a hundred essence. With the dream nail in hand, I head back to Crystal Peak and make the brilliant play of falling down the exact same cavern I just fell down 10 minutes ago. So I go all the way back a third time. This time I get to one of my least favorite rooms in this game. I mean, just look at all these lasers. I feel like I have to pull out my freaking protractor just to make one single jump. Then I find Cornifer to unlock the map for this area. Above him is this little section you shouldn't be able to get to without having the double jump. But I figured out a different way to get up there. Oh my god, that was sick. Holy crap. That felt amazing. Now I'm pretty sure that this is like a super easy skip that everyone knows about, but that's one thing I love about this game. It really just makes you feel so smart whenever you accomplish anything. I continue heading upwards and find a mini boss in the Crystal Guardian. He fires these lasers at you, but he moves very slow, which lets me shred through this fight in less than 30 seconds, giving me access to a bench and 400 geo. Further down, we get introduced to one of my least favorite enemies in the game, this Crystal Fly thing. They fire these crystals onto the ground and then sprout up and damage you if you manage to step on them. They aren't even really Really hard to kill per se they're just so annoying just oh my god let me land on the ground i hate you i find another section that i'm not able to access due to my lack of double jump but luckily there's this little minor beetle right next to it if you can get him to throw his pickaxe at just the right angle you can pogo jump off it and make it up there anyway but here is where disaster strikes oh, come on see this is oh that was really my first death to this stupid guy really that's kind of embarrassing. I managed to make my way through this time and realized that I had done this all for a single grub. Threw my deathless run away for a dumb caterpillar. I continue on right and after getting through a couple decently tense platforming sections, I unlock the crystal heart. This allows you to charge a super dash that pushes you forward until you hit something. The crystal heart is extremely useful for getting across long horizontal gaps that we might find. Now equipped with the crystal heart, I go back through this chamber and make a shortcut back to dirt map. With my geo replenished, I head to slice and buy two more mask frags giving me a sixth mask. I need a little bit more cash to buy everything I want, so I head to Grandpa Grub, who showers me with Geo for rescuing a couple of his children. This gives me just enough Geo to purchase a simple key. I take this down to the City of Tears and use the key to open this hatch to give me entry into the Royal Waterways. The main feature of this area are these little guys who, when you hit them, they make like me right after college and gain a ton of weight. I find a mask fragment, buy a map, and then stumble into the orange line of Boston, a cavern covered in feces. Inside, we find the Dung Defender or as I call them, diapers. He throws these balls of poop around the arena that bounce off the floors and walls, and you've got to track the way they're bouncing to try and avoid them. But that's pretty easy. What's much more difficult is this stupid little baby dive that he always does that I always fail to estimate. Oh my god. Irregardless, he goes down without too much trouble. Defeating the diaper lets us into Yzma's Grove, which we'll need for our Crystal Heart Super Dash to cross these acidic pits. But no longer shall that be a concern for us, as at the end of the grove lies Yzma's Tear, which lets us swim through any water that we might encounter. This allows 
me to reach a ton of previously blocked off areas. After heading through this pit we're dropped in, I make my way to another new area, the Ancient Basin. And things are, uh, not looking good here. I imagine in the lore, Hornet came through here and, like, sucked all the color out with their needle or something. I have no clue what the lore of this game is, but I'm sure it's important. But what's more important is after a couple super dashes, we encounter someone who I definitely remember from my first playthrough. Oh, I remember this guy. Oh, I'm in for a butt whooping. I remember this guy. Yes, on my original run through, this boss gave me huge amounts of trouble. And there's a couple reasons that he's so hard. Firstly, he's just really fast, with his attacks being erratic and rarely conveyed. Secondly, when he sprays goo at us, which is what I did to your mom, by the way, it can be really hard to position yourself to squeeze through the gaps. Thirdly, he spawns these little orange ghosts that get in your way the whole time and mess with your jump patterns. And lastly, uh, this. I get down to my last mask, but manage to string in a heal at just the right moment. And I even managed to build my life back up to a third mask, and then a fourth. Wait, am I about to do this on my first try? Come on, just heal. How many phases does this guy have? Oh. That many. Bro, imagine holding that fat L. Imagine me beating you on the first try. And for beating him, we are given the Monarch Wings and unlock our final major movement ability in this game, the Double Jump. Just five hours in and we can access the vast majority of the game. But our Double Jumping ability is going to immediately be put to the test as the soul of the broken vessel still lingers. And by using our Dream Mail on it, we can enter into a fight with an upgraded version of him, the Lost Kin. Now this was far and away the second hardest boss of my original playthrough. I am not joking when I say probably a quarter of my play time was just spent rematching him over and over and over again. But as you guys have seen, I've gotten a lot better at this game now. So surely, this should be a walk in the park, right? No. No, it was not. So I decided to come back here once I'm much stronger. I pay to have a fast travel stag station point set up here and head out. With all the movement options now unlocked, I decide to head back to some older areas and collect what I miss. And I start with the Forgotten Crossroads. But when I arrive, things are a bit different. Oh, what the heck happened to the crossroads? Why are the crossroads all weird now? I had no idea this was going to happen. Yeah, I guess by killing the broken vessel, we unleashed this orange stuff into the crossroads. And not only is this just absolutely vile to look at, it's also segmented off tons of pathways, making this area much more annoying to navigate. The biggest reason I wanted to come back here, though, was to visit the charm shop, as I've now collected enough charms to get my sixth charm notch, as well as one of the top three best charms in the game, Quick Focus. This, if you couldn't tell, makes focusing much quicker which is an invaluable skill for boss fights and allows you to squeeze way more heals in. And speaking of boss fights, while strolling around the City of Tears, I happen to come across the Watcher Knight boss. Only problem is that I was not prepared at all for this and still have my general exploring charms on. But this guy's attack pattern is pretty simple, so it shouldn't really be a- Okay, and another one's alive now? Alright, this is not feeling sm- Super great. Yeah, this fight becomes infinitely harder once you introduce a second knight, as their constant barrage of attacks don't even give you a second to heal. And since I don't have quick focus equipped, it makes threading and heals even harder. Oh my god, how was I supposed to dodge that ever in a million years? Oh my god, oh my god. In case it wasn't obvious already, I do not win this fight. I decide to try it again, and for my charms, I go with Quick Focus and Shaman Stone. My hope is to rush through each knight by lining up Vengeful Spirit Shots and then hit them both. But without Mark of Pride equipped, it makes my nail smaller than the chances that I actually 100% balloons TD6 for a video. I saw someone online say that it's actually a really bad idea to equip Mark of Pride, because then you just get so used to its massive size that you become much worse with the regular nail. And I can personally vouch for that, as I get ripped a new one in this fight. So this time I opt for Mark of Pride and Quip Focus. This goes significantly better, and I actually manage to kill one of them. But I guess the second one of them dies, another one of them takes their place, so I gotta kill every single one of these guys in the background. I think the point of this fight is supposed to be that the knights are really easy to kill, there's just a lot of them. But since we're doing this with barely any upgrades to our nail, it takes a while to chunk through them. Not to mention, if they start rolling at the same time, you are screwed! Because one will roll along the floor, and the other will bounce to the ceiling, meaning you're guaranteed to take damage. However, I have learned that during the cooldown, there's a ton of time to heal. Sometimes I can even get two or three heals off thanks to quick focus. My biggest tip for you is just to stay in the air as much as possible. And after what feels like forever of fighting... Nice! Whew. That one is a bit of a thinker, jeez. That was like the nerdiest thing that somebody could have said after that. Um, that one is a bit of a thinker. We're rewarded with a ton of Geo, and access to the first Dreamer we were told about before. And after focusing her up, we're one third of the way to unlocking the final boss of the game. For us, that means nothing. We have so much more to do. <laughs> and one of those things is going to be this nearby elevator into the Soul Sanctum. But he serves as just a warm-up, as our true adversary is waiting just outside. Here we go. 
I am nervous for this, bro. This took me like 10 million resets when I first played the game. So I am extremely nervous. Yes, when I first played this game, this boss gave me insane amounts of trouble as his attacks are just absurdly fast and he teleports around the entire arena. So you need to be quick to respond to anything he does. But even though I hadn't played this game in nearly five years and I've forgotten pretty much everything about it, for this fight specifically, all of my muscle memory from my thousands of resets instantly kicked back in as I flawlessly dodged every single one of his attacks, only taking a single hit the entire fight. That fight gave me so much trouble when I was a kid. When I first played this game. Bro. Oh, okay, it's not over. Oh, no, it is over. What? Really? Oh, no, he has a phase two. There we go. I thought that might be. I was like, what? Oh, my God. Okay. Now I remember why this is so hard. Okay, sometimes he does the shockwave. Sometimes he does not. Good to know. Oh, having the double jump is so nice. Here! Okay, boom. Hit him. Hit him. Oh, just... Oh. The goal is to try and get those to immediately hit into the floor, but... Wait, really? Bro's got no third phase? Why did I struggle with that so much as a kid? For defeating the Soul Guardian, we're given our second spell, Desolate Die, which gives us a both a damaging spell that's significantly more powerful than Vengeful Spirit and a way to break through the cracked floors we've been seeing all around Hollow Nest. Before we go backtracking to use it, though, it's time to see the true reason the Soul Guardian gave me so much trouble as a kid, as he has a dreamer form. And in my initial playthrough, this was far and away the boss that took me the most time in the entire game. And it's not even close. In fact, the first time I played this game, trying to beat this boss probably totaled a full half of my playtime. But I decided to take him on now for no other reason than he's just kind of out of the way, so it'd be annoying to come back here. I'll probably get it like first or second attempt, I think. See, the thing about this fight is that the first phase is actually extremely easy. He telegraphs his attacks clearly, most of them can just be avoided with a well-timed jump or dash, and he gives you plenty of opportunity to heal during this lightning ball circle attack. The real problem is that since we have so few nail upgrades, the fight is long, with this first phase taking nearly 10 minutes every attempt. This normally wouldn't be a problem, except his second phase is mind-numbingly hard. He starts off with these rapid-fire dives that you basically need to be dashing 24-7 to move out of the way for. Then he moves on to his attack where he summons tons of these electrical balls at you, not even giving you a second to heal. And this is also the only attack where you can actually damage him. This phase gave me countless deaths. And the worst part is, every time I die to him, I gotta spend 10 minutes beating that first phase again. But it's not like so easy that you can just like turn your brain off. You gotta be paying attention the entire time, making this a mental gauntlet. I attempt this for around an hour before realizing that I'm gonna need higher damage output to rush the second phase and decide to come back once I've upgraded my nail. My next goal is to try and gather lots of geo for several upgrades we're gonna need to power up. So I go to the Relic Seeker and sell off my remaining relics to get me around 5,500 geo. I then take this geo to the bank I found earlier and deposit the max of 4,500 geo. See you later, Millie Bell. Oh my god. What a great girl. Oh, Millie Bell, and one more thing. You know, she probably just she probably just is on her 15. But by using the simple key that we found in the city storerooms, we can open this door in the City of Tears, revealing that Millibel was just on a spa break. And oh, look at that! She was nice enough to give us 1.5 interest on our investment, turning our 4,500 geo into 6,834 geo. How kind of you, Millibel! I take my now geo-lined pockets and head to the charm store and buy out the rest of her stock. Unfortunately, this leaves me just one charm short of unlocking the next notch. So I go to the resting grounds and enter this tomb where the flooring is a little crumbled. I can use desolate dive on it, unlocking a completely new area. Inside, I'm able to grab Soul Eater. Anime joke. This charm takes up a whopping four charm slots, but gives you tons of souls every time you hit an enemy, making it a pretty useful niche case scenario. Now, I should be going back to the charm store and unlock that next notch, but I get distracted and instead find that if I go to the fast travel stag station in the City of Tears, I can actually swim under the wall and head to a completely new area, Kingdom's Edge. By following this path up and swimming through the acidic water section, I come across our second fight with our necklace rival, but this time, things are different. Because forget about the Shaw and the Adidas. Now she's unlocked the Agala, which I was clearly not prepared for. Oh, no, come on. No, dang it. Oh, oh, I almost had it. I decide to switch up my charms and go with Mark of Pride and Shaman Stone, adopting my flawless roguelike philosophy of do big damage, never get hit. Okay, so I got hit. Yeah, this fight is actually decently difficult on account of a couple factors. Firstly, our lack of nail upgrades and persistence to unlock things early means we do very little damage, and thusly, this fight is also very long. Secondly, she's very fast. The attacks that I struggled with the most were her yo-yo ball again, and these spikes she can place around the arena. She'll place up to three of these at a time, forcing you to take time to clear them out, or else you risk accidentally dashing into them. I die again and decide to run it back with good old reliable Mark of Pride and Quick Focus. And while I still definitely struggle, I managed to win first attempt with this setup, and for winning, we're granted access into the cast-off shell, giving us the king's brand, which makes us the 
King of Hollow Nest, I guess. I, I really gotta look up a lore video on this. An hour long? Who's got the time? I mean, uh, uh, please just keep on watching this video, please. It's not too long, thank you. After having a shocking amount of trouble with these nearby hopper enemies, I decided to travel up to the top of Kingdom's Edge where, oh my god, they're back. Upon reaching the top of the area, we enter the Colosseum of Fools. By placing a mark on the first sign, we can attempt the Trial of the Warrior. This is a gauntlet-style enemy rush where the game throws several waves of enemies at you, and you have to beat them all in a row with no break. For this, I opted for Shaman Stone over Quick Focus, as you generally have plenty of time to heal between enemy waves. It starts off with a couple pretty standard enemies. But then, about midway through, spikes sprout out from the ground. They also happen to spawn one of my least favorite enemies in this game, Primal Asphids. I don't know what it is that I hate about these guys. They're, they're not even particularly hard. But the way that they shoot in this three-bullet pattern just ticks me off, man. I can just never properly time my dodges with it. Though I will say having Shaman Stone spells helps out a ton to clearing them out quickly before they have the chance to shoot. After taking on the Zote Killer, they start spamming enemies at me. But since Vengeful Spirit is piercing, it makes fast work of them. The Coliseum ends with a lowered ceiling and us having to take on two grub mothers at once. This proved challenging at first, but just try and get them disjointed, as it's most dangerous when they do their dash bounce at the same time. Once you're able to take one out, the other one's just a piece of cake. And for winning, we're rewarded with a thousand geo and a charm notch. Completing that one also unlocks the second trial, and by just paying 450 geo, we can take it on. This one is staunchly more difficult, giving enemies a tier above the normal ones you see patrolling around. And just a couple bonus in, you're given a single platform above a floor covered in spikes. However, this can be easily circumvented by using well-timed pogo jumps. But things get really sticky when they introduce the asphids in combination with another enemy I hate, these stupid mosquitoes. They just charge at you so fast at the most inopportune moments. Just stop! Why are you so fast? On my second attempt, though, things go much smoother. That is, until they introduce this hopper in this three-inch corner. Like, how, how is this even fair? On my third attempt, though, I remember the secret solution to this boss. That makes quick work of him, and soon after, we move on to the final challenge of this Coliseum. These, I don't know what this is. Okay, it's like a giant ball, and they shoot, okay, a million different directions. I'm gonna die here, unless I use so many shaman spells. Please, please. Oh my lord. These things have a gajillion health. Okay, I think I'm kind of getting a handle on what I need to do a little bit better now. Ooh, ooh. Ooey! Ooh! Oh, he does not seem happy about that, I'm being so frank. Ooh, that hurt, that hurt me, that hurt me, that hurt me, that hurt me. Okay, I think I can heal. Oh, just barely. Oh, shoot, okay. Oh my god. That was, that one was rough. How many more? Oh, I'm done? Oh, thank god. And for completing this arena, not only do we get a ton of geo, but much more importantly, we get a piece of pale ore. This ultra-valuable rock can be used to upgrade our nail at the Nailsmith, increasing its damage from 9 to 13. Alright, now with my newly improved nail, I'm going to go back through all the beginning areas and see what I missed, because I should be able to get pretty much everything I like possible now. I unlocked this elevator for 150 geo, which now permits access between City of Tears and the Forgotten Crossroads. It also brings me right to a soul fragment, which I gladly pick up. And while making my way through Fungal Waste, I encounter a totally new area, Fog Canyon. Which for some godforsaken reason, I cannot find the map to no matter where I look. As I progress, I encounter Quirrell, who was like this swordsmith I met a couple times, but I never really touched on it because it didn't seem important. But like, yeah, okay, just remember that he's a character. This is going to be important in like five minutes. Inside the door lies the teacher archives, which sounds like an area in a Persona game where you'd get to see one of the school's predators in a bikini. Through your carbon absence. Oh, okay. I don't know. There's some stuff going on. And at the bottom of this arena is a giant jellyfish boss. Umu? Oh, Umu? Oh, you, you, moo, moo? Th this guy. His gimmick is that he has a protective exterior membrane, meaning you can't damage him. But luckily, for some reason, Quirrell can. My boy Quirrell! Yo, my boy Quirrell in the spot! Which puts the beast in a vulnerable state where we can attack it. This fight isn't brutally difficult by any means, but the butterfly attack can sometimes spawn like right on top of you, leaving you stunned. Which means, yeah, I did die once. I think the main issue I was having is since you hit Umu so infrequently, you have barely any soul. So I decided to swap in Soul Leader. This gives me way more healing, allowing me to complete the fight. For beating Umu, we're actually able to check off the second dreamer, leaving only one left. I swear, I'm not even intentionally seeking these guys out. I just happen into their arenas, which is something that I find so beautiful about this game. It's so well polished that it's hard to even tell what's a main story quest and what's a completely optional area. I continue making my way through Fog Canyon before stumbling into a new part of the map, the Queen's Gardens. And dude, just, just stop trying to be Green Path. You will never be Green Path. Deep inside, there's this little hut called the Overgrown Mound. And after fighting some pesky mosquitoes, I received my third spell, 
Howling Wraths. This lets me fire a huge upwards blast. And if all three of these little humps hit the target, it does absurd damage, making it our most powerful spell thus far. Right after though, I discover that most of Queen's Garden is blocked by this black void gate. So I decide I'll just come back later. Oh. Why even have that there if you can just get on the other side of it? What? Well, never mind, I guess. I journey further into the gardens, blast through this flying mantis room with Howling Wrath, grab the map from Cornifer, collect essence from the spear tree, pick up the love key from this rotting corpse, find the average destiny viewer before falling down this hole and entering Deepness. Now, Deepness is notoriously one of the most difficult areas in the entire game, but with all our upgrades, I feel pretty prepared to take it on. Luckily, I was dumped pretty far into this area, so after dodging some terrifying spiders, I arrive at the distant village. I enter this house and decide to sit on the bench. All right. Time to get up. Oh, 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 guys. Um, I, I'm kind of stuck, guys. I'm a little. Um, I'm actually. I'm kind. I'm kind of. I'm. I'm stuck, guys. I'm. Uh, 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 uh. I wake up wrapped in silk, deep inside the beast's den, filled to the brim with these weird masked-looking bug things. Turns out their mask makes them completely invulnerable from the front until they open up their face to attack. These guys give me a ton of trouble initially, as I would keep using my nail to try and trigger their attack, making them vulnerable. However, it would be too quick to actually get any damage off, and I'd always end up getting hit, which does a whopping two masks. After some trial and error, I learned the best way to deal with them is to just wait. Once they open themselves up to attack you, hit them fast and quickly dash away. Upon reaching the end of the den, we find the last dreamer, Hera, meaning we can now officially enter the Black Egg Temple and take on the final boss. But believe you me, we're not even close. In fact, I don't even think we're halfway to the end yet. Also, I guess that was the corpse of Hornet's Mother? I I'm not even gonna try and understand how Weird Spaghetti Monster somehow creates tall girl boss beetle. I managed to make my way out of the den and activate a new fast travel point here. I decide to finish out Exploration of Deepness and grab the surrounding grubs and geo deposits before discovering a new area that's once again blocked off by this black void gate. I also find this train that requires a pass that I don't have, and basically what I'm trying to say is there's a lot of reasons I gotta come back here. Further up, I find this extremely difficult pogo nail section. These crawl appeals are invincible and move in one direction at one speed, so you have to carefully time several nail jumps off of him in a row to get through. Then they start throwing platforms at you that you need to get around and don't even get me started on when you have to go vertically. But it's all worth it. As for our efforts, we're given the ever valuable soul fragment. But on my way out, I find truly the saddest thing I could ever imagine. Zoot! My king! The king has been slain! I'll save you, buddy! How do I save him? Save Zoot button. Where, where is the save Zoot button? Let me access him. Now I would do it for you, for Zoe. And I never did figure out how to free him for the rest of this playthrough. So he's just damned to forever stay stuck in those webs. Sometimes God has got to take his favorite stars out of the sky, or they would shine even brighter than he did. Bless up to Zote the goat. Anyway, that would be cloth. He's even cooler than Zote. You know why? Because she's honest. And she's like, yo, this place is scary. And you know what? She is right. Everyone else is acting like I'm supposed to accept this all as just normal scenery. Heading over to the left, I find the failed tramway, which leads to Galen, the warrior spirit. I decided to challenge him, which ends up being a mistake because he is much harder than I planned for. He's got this cane and he spins it around the entire arena. And not only is this thing fast, but it is massive. Like, it takes up a freaking tenth of the screen, making it very hard to avoid. Your chances to heal are basically zero. And once he gets low, he starts bouncing around a second and even a third ball. This leads to me eventually dying. But you know what we do when we die during a boss fight. We whip out the quick focus and go freaky on that guy. But by the end of the fight, I do get down to one heart and things are really intense. Okay, got a double healing. Sick. Okay, dodge. Hit. Nope. Hit. Nope. He hit me. Ah! Oh. I got him! Nice! For defeating him, we're given 200 essence, putting us at nearly 400. I continue exploring deep into the failed tramway and eventually find myself the tram pass, allowing me to now use all the abandoned trains across the map. I start by returning to the one in deep nest, which brings me back to the ancient basin. This time I find a fountain that asks me to dump 3,000 geo into it for respect of the king. I've got the stuff coming out of my ears at this point, so I gladly do it and receive my third and final soul fragment, unlocking a second soul orb storage. And I figured that the train just happening to bring me here really felt like a sign that I should attempt the lost kin again. Yeah, it probably wasn't a sign, honestly, just like a meaningless coincidence. By approaching the gate we saw earlier, now that we have the King's Crest, it actually opens, permitting us access into the abyss. By heading to the right, we find these strange little black tendrils that look like the insane looking bird guy's quirk from My Hero Academia. Like, why does this guy have a bird head but human hands? A and his power doesn't even relate to being a bird! Like, what sense does this even make? Later on, we start finding these black spirits that look like the shade that comes out of us when we die. And apparently these things are called siblings? 
Siblings? What? S siblings to who? Every waking moment you tempt me, hour-long lore video. I try and blast across this pit, but the tendrils keep whacking me, preventing me from crossing. But by climbing to the top of this tower, we can turn on the light inside, which projects down into the tendrils, allowing us to cross. And for making it here, we find this bowl overflowing with black water. What the heck? I'm stuck! Get out, get out! Come on! Oh, what's wrong? Oh my god! What the heck just happened? The shade cloak. Whoa. Cool. And over to the left, there's this group of screaming statues. If we use Howling Wrath while standing on the podium, it'll actually upgrade our spell for us, turning into an Abyss Shriek. And with those important upgrades gotten, it's time to leave the Abyss. Back in the Ancient Basin, we fall down this hole, and at the end, we're given another piece of Pale Ore. And by returning to the Seer, he rewards us for gathering 300 Essence by giving us another piece of Pale Ore. And with the two pieces of Ore in hand, we can take them back to the Nailsmith for another upgrade to our nail. That nail looks Freaking sick, man. All right, now that we upgraded our nail, I want to get some other upgrades, mostly charms. But before we head to the charm shop, we need to ensure that we have 25 charms, as that will give us access to all of her available sold notches. And we currently need five more. So I decided to backtrack to some areas that I know I barely explored, starting with Crystal Peak. Upon arriving, though, I am completely caught off guard. Oh, okay, Enraged Guardian. This seems bad. Oh my god, this seems... Oh my god, this seems so bad. And I'm dead. And I'm dead. I died immediately. Holy crap, that was awful. The only nice thing about this boss is he only does two damage per hit, and he has low defense. So you either kill him fast, or he kills you. So even though I died two more times here, it takes me less than two minutes in total across all my attempts. Hiding behind him is my reward in a mask fragment. By climbing to the top of the peak, we reach Hollowness Crown and grab yet another pale ore. I also find the shopkeeper's key, which if I give to Sly and Dirtmouth, he's able to open up a storage closet and start stocking new items. And we able to pick up two of the required five charms we need here, a soul fragment, the elegant key, and a fourth mask fragment, giving us our seventh mask. But with my pockets completely empty, I decided to take a quick stop at the Grub Village and replenish my supply of Chia. Then I head over to Leg Eater, from whom I can buy three fragile charms that are absurdly powerful but break when you die. More importantly, that puts me at the 25 total needed charms. But before heading back to the shop, my ADHD medication wears off, so I get distracted and take a stop in Fog Canyon. However, I accidentally stumble into perhaps the most infuriating room in this entire game. This room is surrounded by all these jellyfish that you have to try and avoid. Now you're probably thinking, why not just kill them? That'll make it easy. Well, because when you do, they explode and they take away two hearts per explosion. You need to ever so carefully thread every single jump and dash to avoid exploding. And while it leads to some great tense moments like this, For the most part, it's completely frustrating. While I'm able to make it past this exploding hallway, I fall immediately onto the lump in this wall, killing me. And the last bench I rested at was all the way back in Dirt Mouth. So I gotta come all the way back to Fog Canyon. But turns out, instead of my shade being at the beginning of the room like it normally is, it's all the way at the end. I mean, if I want to get all my Geo back, I have to make it all the way through first. Yeah, we gotta be so careful. So we have to make it pretty far in. Nice. Okay, that did not work the way I wanted it to. <sighs> okay, hold the freaking phone. <gasps> oh my god, I'm actually gonna lose it all. Holy crow. He's right there. Oh my god. I do not want the knockback to hit me into this. So I will do it like this. You know what? I'm just gonna go. Oh my god. Hold the freaking phone. Are you joking? No. Oh, okay. Well, I learned. First of all, first lesson I learned give myself steady body. Oh, I just lost 2,000 Geo. Oh, that sucks. And as sad as that was, like, kind of skill issue, TBH, why did I dash back into the fray after I already made it through? That, that that literally made no sense. Irregardless, I make it back, and this time I have steady body equipped, which gives me no knockback on my nail swings, finally letting me get through this room and grab my shade. What did I do that all for? A charm notch. Okay, that was actually worth it. <laughs> I was so prepared to be like, oh yeah, whatever this could be. And then it was a charm notch. I'm like, oh, okay, you know what, actually...
I head back through Queen's Gardens, grabbing some grubs, relics, and unlock the fast travel stag station here, which also happens to be the final one in the game. And for finding every single one, Mr. Stag rewards us here with a new station in a completely new area called Stagness. But before we head there, I sell off all my relics and head to Baldura's Charm Shop and buy two more charm notches, putting us at 10, with only one left to find. With those two notches giving us a considerable power upgrade, I decide to head back to the Coliseum as it's required to achieve 112%. The Coliseum, of all the things I grinded out on my first playthrough, was actually the thing that made me give up on Hollow Knight. After hours and hours of attempts, I just couldn't do it, and frustrated, I put down the game permanently. So not only was this going to be impossible, but I also had something to prove. Not just to the audience who are going to leave replies about how bad I am anyway, but also to myself. Now the beginning waves of these trials are actually pretty easy, just throwing out some medium level enemies that can be taken out with good timing. The first wave that really starts to give me trouble is the vertical tower, as here they send out my absolute worst nightmare. Yes, this tower has you fight simultaneously two of my least favorite enemies in the game. And this always does a number on me. No matter how well I'm doing, this phase always drains me of my life and soul, both literally and figuratively. But luckily, there's a phase that helps you rebound from that. You see, when this little electrical guy from the Soul Sanctum spawns in, he also comes with these little soul sacks dragging along the ground to try and make things more difficult. But the next phase doesn't trigger until you kill both the real enemy and this soul sack. So by using the Dream Nail on the soul sack, you can easily get yourself to max soul and consequently max life. This makes the next couple waves an absolute breeze. Until they bring back the mosquitoes again, like why? They already had their moment in the sun. Can't you just go away? After listening to these a couple times, I decide to leave and come back once all my spells and my nail is upgraded. And to start on that, I go past this hidden wall in Kingdom's Edge and get to an area that requires a series of desolate dives to progress. And this cave is long. In fact, it's so long it goes all the way down into the ancient basin, requiring tons of desolate dives across the way. So you already know what's going to be at the bottom of this pit, right? A small deposit of 500 Geo. Oh, did you think I was going to say the upgrade to the dive ability? Well, now you know how I felt after being sent down this rabbit hole for 10 minutes. But this trip wasn't all for naught, as right outside we find, without a doubt, the best charm in the game, Quick Slash. This makes your Nail Slash leagues faster, which is doubly useful as you both do more damage and collect more souls. I genuinely think that we would not have been able to get through this playthrough without it. But the upgrades don't stop there, as we can now use Crystal Heart to get across this Crystal Peak Chasm that we fell into twice to reveal another another snail shaman's hut, and at the end, the real upgrade to our dive attack, Descending Dark. After that, we head to the City of Tears, and if we insert the elegant key that we got from Sly into this door, we can upgrade our Vengeful Soul into Shade Soul. And with all these upgrades obtained, I figure it's as good a time as any to try the Soul Guardian fight again. As per usual, the first phase is a joke, but the tension quickly rises during the second phase. I know it's impossible to dodge him forever, so I abuse Quick Slash and just spam my nail every second I can, and use all the extra soul to rapid fire off spells. Every time he does it, for some reason, I squeeze my controller as hard as I can, and it's extremely painful. I don't know why I keep doing it. Every time he does it, I don't know why am I squeezing my controller. My wrists are honestly killing me from doing it. Wait, really? That was it? He's done? Bro, I can't believe I spent an hour doing that the other day. I just cooked him. Oh my god. Bro, that was first attempt. Feeling incredible coming off that victory, I decide to take on that secret location we unlocked and head to Stagnest. Upon arriving, we're immediately treated to a soul fragment, and heading right outside the station takes us to the Howling Cliffs, the very peak of Hollowness. First up is a warrior spirit named Gorb, who isn't really all that tough, but I do want to make special notice of the sounds they make. A truly incredible display. Defeating them rewards us with a hundred essence. Further in, I find Nailmaster Mata, who teaches the Cyclone Slash, which is basically just the big spin attack. I started seeing an insane amount of blue butterflies all around, so I follow them, and their swarm grows larger and larger until I'm led to a charm called Joni's Blessing, which is useless for now, but trust me, it will be really important later on. I enter this nearby cave and find what looks to be a lantern, so I do the same thing that ended me up in the Boy Scout Infirmary 15 years ago and whack the ever-living crap out of it, which somehow actually works, and it lights a red flame. Because of that, upon returning Dirtmouth, turns out that some sort of circus has moved into town? And they even got this accordion playing guy? Turns out this is the Grim Troop. And no, it's not a group of 30-year-old edgy millennials who play Panic at the Disco covers. Instead, this is like a group of circus people, and they have this tradition that they come to Hollow Nest sometimes, and uh, uh, yeah, I don't really know. I skipped all the dialogue. All I know is that they give us this charm called the Grim Child. And we have to go to the three marked locations around the 
map defeated. Upon arriving, I got to defeat this little ghost looking thing who dies out quicker than my 10th birthday party after my parents told me they were getting a divorce. I grabbed the one in the Crystal Peak, City of Tears, and finally in Green Path before returning to Grim. More masterful opening act. Yeah, Holmes with excitement. Dear child, you've done so well. Let your fire burn even brighter. What was that? Oh, whoa, he's a big boy now. Just don't neglect our dance, for it continues. Keep hunting the scout. Oh, there's more? Oh, I gotta do even more? Oh, wow. I will do that as I go. Like, as I as I pass them. For now, though, I head back to Deep Nest, as we can use the Shade Cloak to get through this black void gate, which leads the path to the Sharp Shadow Charm, which makes our Shadow Dash deal damage. Well, that's one charm that's never gonna get equipped. I also find this hidden wall that reveals, uh, the... What the frick? What? 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 Wait, what? What the heck is that? What? I don't- I- okay. I didn't even process what I just saw. What? Ah! What am I doing there? It's literally my exact same sprite. What the heck? What is that? Oh, that's bad. Oh, that's extremely bad. It's me. Oh, that would be- uh, Is it gonna be like a shadow fight? Oh. Oh, you know, that thing actually looks a little bit different than me now that I take another look. Yes, this is Nosk, and he's actually pretty difficult until you realize that if you just stand right here in this corner, he can't reach you. Then you just gotta make sure to watch out for the fallen goop, and with some well-timed dodges, I'm able to defeat him. And my reward for killing that abomination is the second piece of pale ore, meaning we only need one more to fully upgrade our nail. But while we're down here, I decide it's time to finally take on the boss who has caused us the most struggle this playthrough. Okay, this is just gonna be so stupid, but I just wanna try it. I'm just gonna go in, not even dodge a single time, just spam the crap out of my nail with quick slash, and then see what happens. That was so greedy. So paid off though. Just spam him. Oh my god. Is this actually working? Oh my god, quick slash is broken. Oh my god, why is this actually working? This should not work. In no realm should this ever work. It's because he takes knockback damage for some godforsaken reason that I'm not going to complain about. Is that it? Oh my god! Wow, I can't believe that actually worked. All I did was just get in there and spam the crap out of him. Quick Slash is actually so good. Holy crap, I never realized how good that freaking charm is. And if that doesn't convince you of the power of Quick Slash, I don't know what will. Now is on to the Colosseum. Now you may be wondering, hey Shawnee, why would you do the Colosseum before getting the last piece of pale ore to fully upgrade your nail? Wouldn't that make this all a lot easier? And you're right, it would. But for some reason, I thought that the Colosseum gave you a second piece of pale ore, so I was actually gunning to get this nail upgrade. For my charms though, I opted to go with Mark of Pride, Shaman Stone, and Soul Leader. As spells are generally more useful useful against these low health enemies than quick slash would be. But just because we have all these upgrades, this is by no means easy. Oh no, I die plenty of times. Even if I manage to get past all the things I struggled with before, they start introducing mini bosses, an even smaller mosquito arena, bullet dodging hell, and this barrage of bouncing spiders. But by some miracle, I make it to the final foe of the trials. I don't know what that is, and I don't like it. What the hell is that? God tamer. Okay. Doesn't feel good. Okay, he has that move that I hated from the other battle. Okay, I see how this works now. So when he does that move, you just kind of have to sprint past it. Like this. Okay. Oh! Nice! Oh, he hit me. Okay. I desperately need to get a heal in. Oh, crap. Crap. Okay, hold on. Oh, oh I think this is my chance. Okay, heal. Oh, no, no, nope. Definitely not. Oh, no. Oh no, it's all over. Oh, I could feel it. It's all over! Damn it! No! But on my very next attempt, I managed to climb right back there. The main thing I realized from the last fight is that you can just entirely ignore the knight. And you only really need to focus on the beetle. Just make sure to jump over his roll and then keep dashing as he bounces back to wherever you land. Then for double damage, fire shade souls when they're both on the ground. And after just a few minutes of good concentration... <gasps> oh, really? It's done? It's over? Oh my god! Yes! 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 Oh my god! Die! 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 I am the god tamer! 
Holy crap, yes. I cannot express to you all how amazing it felt to finally best this insurmountable gauntlet over seven years later. It was kind of a bummer that there's no real reward for it besides some geo. The glee I got from taking out was definitely more than enough. I head to the father grub and pick up his rewards for saving his children, of which I have now saved 31, so he gives me a ton of geo and also the sixth and final piece of pale ore. But before we upgrade her now, with the 10,000 geo we now have, I decide to upgrade one of my fragile charms. I haven't really talked about these yet because I've been really scared to use them as, like I said before, they break upon your death. But basically, they give you monstrously powerful effects. With fragile heart, you get two extra hearts. With fragile strength, you get 50% extra nail damage. But do I decide to power up any of those broken charms? No! I decide to upgrade fragile greed, which gives you a 20% boost to geo dropped by enemies. If you bring this fragile charm to this small side tent by the Grim Troop, you meet Divine. And no, this one's not eating dog feces. She'll suck up your fragile charm for a whopping 10,000 Geo and turn it into an unbreakable one. Now at the time, this seemed like a brilliant idea. I'm gonna need to gather tons of Geo to upgrade the other charms. So let's get this charm upgraded that gets you more Geo done first, right? Well, this was actually a horrible idea. Like, seriously, I can't even believe I did this. As for this to pay off, the Greed Charm would need to earn you over 10 thousand geo. Why not just upgrade one of the other charms instead, as then you'll need to collect, you know, 10,000 less geo. Not to mention, the primary way you earn geo is by selling relics to the relic seeker, and unbreakable greed doesn't even help with that. Let's say I really want to use fragile greed to earn my last bit of geo needed for the last upgrade. Well, even if you happen to die, Leg Eater will repair the charm for just 150 geo. That means, in order for this exchange to be worth it, I would need to die wearing it 67 in time. In no world will I ever even come close to that amount of death. This ends up being a massive inconvenience towards the end of this run, and added at least two hours onto my playtime. Okay, sorry for the long rant, but that's gotta be one of the stupidest things I've done since my last video where I called magnifying grass bad. But now we've entered the end game of this playthrough before, yeah, I'll get to you. So I decide to mark the few unexplored locations left on our map and fill them out. First up, we've got Elder Who, another warrior spirit fight. This one's a piece of cake. He just throws these little pool floaty donuts at you from above, but gives you plenty of time to get out of the way. Then, when he does this attack, just make sure you shade dash correctly and it should be no problem. For defeating him, we're given 100 essence. We take a brief intermission from our map filling to head over to the Nailsmith, who upgrades our nail one final time, turning it into the pure nail, with a total of 21 damage per hit. The pure nail forge, my work in this lifetime comes to an end. My only remaining desire is to see and feel the nail strike true. I beg you, cut me down. As my final moments of life, I want to taste the- Wait, really? Am I supposed to kill him? Okay. Oh my god. That that seemed really dark. Alright, whatever you say, man. Manslaughter aside, back in the royal waterways, I find this tunnel I hadn't explored filled with these tiny, gross, spineless bugs, also known as League of Legends players. And at the end of it is a boss named Flukemar. I guess I was supposed to find this cave way earlier in the game because I absolutely tear through this with no struggle. And for my triumph, I'm given a new charm, Fluke Nest. Up next, I head to Kingdom's Edge with my Grim Child to feed him the next tier of flames. The ghosts have been buffed, but there's still no problem to take out. Then, by passing this void gate, we can encounter another warrior spirit in Markov. The gimmick of his battle is that he has these swords he launches at you while protecting himself with this revolving shield. I actually really struggled with this fight at first, as the speed of his shield makes it pretty hard to avoid. Eventually though, I realize you can just stand in the corner and he'll literally never hit you. For slaughtering him, we're given 250 essence. One thing I can't believe I hadn't tried out until now was to click the right button on this train in the ancient basin. This takes us to perhaps the largest part of the map we've yet to explore, the hive. The hive is surprisingly difficult, as it features these fat bees that bounce all around the screen, and upon hitting you, do two full masks of damage. There's not really any easy enemies in the area to farm heals off of either, the only one really is just these homing needle bees. Irregardless, after some struggling, I managed to make it through this stretch and reach this region's boss, the Hive Knight. I don't remember if this boss fight is hard or not. Ah! Okay, I'm just getting in there with my thing. Oh, okay, this is gonna be one of those kind of bosses. Lots of phases, but I got three health back. Okay, I do not like that attack. That seems bad. Oh, and he still gets to attack me during all this. Oh, okay, we need to heal. Stop doing that! Damn it! Damn it, damn it, damn it. This, unfortunately, puts us all the way back at the entrance of the hive. I Meaning we've got to take the extremely arduous journey back so as to not lose the 5,000 geo my shade is holding. Mm. Oh my god. 
Oh god, oh god, oh god. No, 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 no. Freaking mass fragment. Okay, sure. I do manage to make it back, but I've only got four health for this fight. Uh, 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 okay, I need a heal. Oh. Okay, that feels incredible. Oh, nice. Hit him with the freaking dream nail. Okay, hit it. Okay, you just gotta watch out for this. The thing is that you just have to watch yourself while you're doing that. Like, I, I, I tend to watch the boss, which is kind of like my fatal flaw in these things. I'm like, what is he doing? What is he doing? But you need to just watch yourself. Oh, uh, okay. I strung a heal in there. I strung another one in there. Oh my god, that was so greedy and it worked out. Okay, that's his worst attack by far. Oh, I killed him. Oh, nice. Okay. Woo. And for defeating the Hive Knight, we're given Hive Blood. A mostly useless charm that will end up saving our butts for one specific part later on. The Hive Queen reveals to us some more lore that I don't understand about an infection in the kingdom, which is what I guess those orange bulbs were, and then we leave the Hive. If we go through this offshoot passageway in the kingdom's edge, we can enter the Tower of Love. With the love key we got earlier, we're allowed admittance inside. At the top, we're challenged by the Collector, who's got more glass jars than the average One Piece fan. He drops said jars on you, and they're all filled with low-level enemies. As long as you watch out for where they're falling, this is a pretty easy fight. With the Collector defeated, we can go up and grab three grubs, as well as the Collector's map. This shows us the location of all of the remaining grubs on the map for us to save. Next, I head to the Queen's Gardens, where I find this area behind a void gate, which leads to an arena fight with some mantises. Luckily for us though, Base Queen Cloth comes to our defense and helps us thin out their numbers. Though I guess wiping out their population kinda angers them, as we're then attacked by the Traitor Lord. And this guy is no joke. His attacks are are relentless. One of his toughest attacks is the full screen shockwave he throws down that you need to shade dash through at the exact right moment. Obviously, I did not, so I gotta try this fight again. And I discover that some of his attacks even do two masks. Oh god. Okay, yes. Attack the other guy. Oh my god. Ooh. Ooh. Ah, no, 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 no. Please handle this. Handle this. Oh. See ya. Got a blast. Get another one in. Get another one in. Oh, that was kind of brutal. This thing, this thing ain't no joke. Okay. Oh, oh, oh. It's hard because when you use your dash, you just incidentally use your shadow. And I'm like, I don't know if he's gonna use his bad attack. Like this one, yeah. Okay. Absorb. Wait, what, who died? Oh, the boss, okay. Nice. I thought it was Rock or whatever her name is. Whew! Wait, you died? No, she didn't. No, she didn't. She's fine. Okay, wake up now. Okay, can you wake up? Oh my god, it did die! Well, that was something. A true battle of a mighty warrior. So intense, so complex. It's really everything I could hope for. Thanks for all your help, my friend. For a tiny bug, you set a valiant example. We'll meet again, I'm sure of it. You're dead. But Claw's sacrifice was not in vain, as this opens up the path to the White Lady. I have a gift, held long for one of your kind, half of a whole. When united, great power is granted, and on the path, great power it will need. What is this? The White Fragment. With the White Fragment collected, we've got just one thing left to do in the Queen's Gardens, and that's face off against Marmu, the warrior spirit. Her main and only attack is spinning in a ball all around the arena. She actually gives me a bit of trouble until I realize that she takes knockback, meaning you can just repeatedly swing your nail, and it just becomes the world's easiest game of Pong. For defeating her, we're given 200 essence. Now it's just time to tie up some loose ends. I grab the last two flames needed to power up my Grim Child, explore this new area in Green Path. What the heck is that? What the frick? What the what the heck was that? I guess that was Oon. Then we learn the final nail art from the Painter Nail Master, which makes us a true nail master. When we return to Dirtmouth, Sly the shopkeep reveals that he is also a nail master, I guess, and he gives us a charm to let us charge our nail arts quicker. Oh my god, that's his nail? That's awesome. Like, how does this guy even wield that thing? I love it. With that all done, it's time to use the collector's map to grab the remaining grubs we need. None of these particularly stand out, as they're usually just in high areas or behind hidden walls. I do set up a dream gate outside of a stack station, though, which 
allows me to insta-teleport there at the cost of one essence. This makes getting around the map leagues easier. But besides that, I track all the grubs down before finding the 46th and final one in the ancient basin. With that completed, now's probably a good time to go over everything we'll need for 112%. Thankfully, a ton of the categories we've already finished, like beat all required bosses, collect every grub, finish the Coliseum Fools, get all upgraded spells and equipment, etc, etc. The only categories we have remaining are collect every charm, collect 2400 essence, collect the last mass shards, finish the Groom Troop storyline, and then the Godmaster DLC, which dear god will have to save for last. So I start off this list by going for the final essence we need and finding the False Knight's Dreamer version, the failed champion. And you know, it's just a harder version of literally the first boss in the game, how hard could it really be? The main reason this boss is so difficult is they did my least favorite thing they do to bosses in this game to make them harder and doubled their damage. This combined with the fact that hitting him doesn't give you any soul, meaning no spells and no healing, makes this boss a lot harder than you'd expect. However, after about 10 minutes of attempts, I learned the best strategy is just to stay on the ground as much as possible. His club just swings way too high for you to be safe up there. The only time you really need to be in the air is when he sends the shockwave at you, and with that we're able to defeat the failed champion and get 300 essence, meaning we've only got 100 essence to go. I head back to the fungal wave and after some tight platforming, manage to save a sweet looking caterpillar named Bretta. After chatting with her, she decides to move into Dirt Mouth, and visiting her at her home will give us a mask fragment, completing our eighth mask. Then it's on to the Royal Waterways to fight our final dream version, the Dung Defender. He's got some new attacks like this screen wide poop blast, but he leaves himself open a ton, meaning we can just spam quick slash to win. Wait, he's just sleeping? Oh, he didn't die? He's just sleeping? Oh, that's funny. With that, we can head back to the Seeker and get a Mask Shard, as well as get him to awaken our Dream Nail, which should let us enter the minds of people we were previously unable to. After that, the Seer just keeps talking and talking, and I just skip past everything he says. But no! No, no, the Seer's dying! He died. Oh my god, and I didn't even read any of his final words. I didn't listen to a single thing the dude was yapping about. I feel kind of bad now. With that weighing eternally heavy on my conscience, we head into the abyss as we need to grab a charm that's a little involved to get. You see, this is the lifeblood chamber, and we need to get 15 of those blue lifeblood masks to unlock it. This is difficult because unlike normal masks, these are impermanent and disappear upon getting hit. So to make this easier, I set up a dream gate right next to it. From there, I equip Joni's blessing that turns our eight masks into 12 blue ones, and lifeblood heart that gives us an extra two, meaning we just have to find one of these lifeblood nests and then teleport to our dream gate opening the chamber, and allowing us to collect the lifeblood core charm. And speaking of charms, I realized I forgot to grab my reward for collecting all the grubs, so after being showered with Geo by the father grub, I collect the grubber flies elegy charm. Then we head to deep nest and find the weaver's den, which gives us weaver song, meaning that once we complete the white fragment, we'll have every charm in the game. I pick up two more mass fragments before heading to the black egg temple, but here we have no plans to take on the boss. Instead, by sitting on the bench inside, we're able to view our completion percentage, and we're currently sitting at 103 out of 112%. Since 5% of that is got home content, it means we've only got four things left to do. First up, it's now time to show Grim that we've collected three more flames on our Grim child, to which she rewards us by fighting us. And this drove me insane while I played it. Like, I had to drag this stupid kid all across the map for six flames for your dumb ritual, and you reward us by attacking us? What the hell? Is he stupid? Irregardless, this fight is tough, and the toughest part is that in order to gain admittance to it, you need to have Grim Child equipped, wasting two charm slots. I tried a couple different layouts for my charms, but ultimately decided on Quick Slash, Mark of Pride, Grub Song, and Nail Master's Glory, deciding to leave my quick focus at home. While I got bombarded on the first two attempts, on the third one, I realized that Grim actually telegraphs his attacks very clearly, so as long as you're quick, you should be able to dodge most of them. His most annoying one is probably this little kickflip thing that he does, but you just need to be careful to dash over him. He also does this pillar attack that allows you to heal. Now this might all sound easy, but this fight is still an endurance test, as you need to immediately dodge every single attack, or you can quickly snowball and lose like 3 or 4 health, which happens to me during his little balloon attack, knocking me dangerously low. Oh! Oh! Come on, just do your down Z. Okay, I needed that so bad. Oh, come on. I, I feel like I deserve that. Oh, oh, come on. Uh, uh. Oh, heal. Okay. Oh, it didn't matter. Oh, I got to heal off though. Okay. Huge pog. And I got another one. Oh my God. Hit, hit. Okay. Oh my God. I, oh, I don't think I deserved that. Yes. Oh my god, take that. That took like 10 minutes, bro. That's why I'm the hollow freaking knight, man. More flames? How many flames? Oh, he gave me a charm notch. 
Damn, I'll get as many flames as you freaking want, man. Now, before collecting the last of the flames, we want to make sure to upgrade both our Fragile Strength and Fragile Heart Charm with Divine. And in order to do that, we're going to need 27,000 Geo. Now, wouldn't it be nice if we, I don't know, had an extra 10,000 Geo? For this grind, I get to the City of Tears, as there are these big warrior guys that give you like 80 Geo each. And since I already have 11,000 Geo, I only need to gather 16,000. And by only, I mean Jesus Christ, this took me so long, like at least an hour and a half of grinding. I don't know if I'm going to use Unbreakable Heart, but several times I did think about giving up and only upgrading Strength. But with that long grind done, we have the 27,000 Geo, so we can upgrade both of our charms to the Unbreakable version. Now it's on to finishing the Grim Troop quest. And the Flame Guardian Ghost things are hard this time, as they all deal a whopping two masks per hit. My favorite. The first one actually manages to kill me, but I quickly find the solution of coming in with Max Soul and Shaman Stone equipped and then just spamming spells. I noticed looking at the map, though, that this time there are four flames available, and after collecting the first three, I head to Deep Nest to find the fourth, only to instead find the accordion guy from the hallway. He congratulates me on collecting all the flames, but asks me if I believe in the tradition of the Grim Troop, to which I of course respond, I have no idea what's going on here. I really just want my completion point. Mr. Accordion says that if I wish to end this tradition and not have to fight the harder version of Grim, I could just meet him where I first lit the flame. Now let us destroy the anchor and banish the master, shall he never return here again. Oh my god, bro. You're crazy for this one. I thought you were just the accordion guy. And with that, the Grim Troop and also our Grim Child have been banished from Hollow Nest. But lucky for us, this cool looking guy named Nim just happens to move in, and you replaced our Grim Child charm with Carefree Melody, which lets us sometimes avoid damage when hit. With the Grim Troop cast out, that leaves just 2% left. First up, we need to Dream Nail the King's Corpse down in the Ancient Basin. Previously, this wouldn't work, but now with the Awakened Dream Nail, we're able to enter the White Palace. And what follows is a brutally difficult platforming section, where you're given very little healing, you have to avoid all sorts of saw blades and perform stuff like this, and this, and this and this and this and whatever this is. Oh my god! I do have some assistance though in the form of Hive Blood, as even though we're given very little healing, Hive Blood will heal the most recent mask you damage. And since this isn't like a boss fight, just performing platforming sections, we can take our leisure. Every time we fail a trick, we can just wait for Hive Blood to restore our health. This helps monumentally as I take, um, a little bit of damage. But finally, after 45 minutes inside the palace, I am finally able to make it to the end. Here I can collect the other half of the white fragment and our final charm, King Soul. Meaning we've got just one thing to do before moving on to the DLC, the Delicate Flower. The Delicate Flower is a quest in which you need to bring this flower from the mourner all the way to our lover's grave over in the Queen's Gardens. Only catch is that if you even take a single point of damage, the flower breaks and you have to start all over again. Which means you got to get from here all the way to here without being hit by enemies, obstacles, or anything else. And if you use any fast travels, you're banned as well. It's famously known to be one of the most frustrating quests in the entire game. So I loosely map out my route and then embark on my delicate journey. The main way I'm going to dispel enemies on this path is using spells, as that'll allow me to safely attack them from far away and not risk damage. Which is exactly why I waited until now to do this quest. You see, King Soul as a charm is actually complete garbage, but it is good in this one specific scenario. King Soul is the only charm in the game that generates soul automatically, so by just waiting around, we can refill our soul meter. This means I have effectively infinite spells. As long as I'm patient, which I'm not. The only downside to King Soul here is that it costs a whopping five charm slots, making our other charm selection super limited. That's where I can pull out my secret weapon. While it might appear that we've got just six charms left, there's actually a workaround to this. By repeatedly trying to equip a charm that actually costs more notches than we have, we can enter a state called Overcharm. Here we do actually get to equip the large charm, but take double damage. This, of course, doesn't matter to us, as we can't take any damage at all. Using this method, I'm able to equip King Soul, Shaman Stone, and Spell Twister for better spells, Steady Body for stability, and Mark of Pride in case I do need to kill anything with my nail. While this setup makes it easy to dispose of most things, I accidentally make a wrong turn through the fungal waste, meaning I'll have to go through the horror that is Fog Canyon. Luckily, I don't run into a single large jellyfish, letting me advance to the final area, Queen's Garden. And not only does this place have tons of enemies to deal with, it also has thorns everywhere that I need to be super careful of. Thankfully, I make it through, and it's on to the hardest part of this entire quest. Now, I... 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 I'm so scared. Okay... Okay. Holy crap, did we just do it first try? Did we just do it first try? Oh my god, I've never done that before. Holy crap. <laughs> Immediately after. 
And before you go on and comment, well, you actually could have just taken out all the enemies first along the path, as long as you don't rest on the bench. Well, yeah, and I also could have played the entire game with a freaking action replay on and used the hitless cotton sheet, but I actually like playing my games. Upon returning to the mourner, she gives us a mask fragment, completing our ninth and final mask, putting us at 107%, leaving just the Godmaster DLC left, which I'm actually really excited to see it because I don't know anything about this pack at all. To activate the DLC, we gotta go to the Royal Waterways and break this hidden wall. This brings us to the Junk Pit, and if we insert this simple key inside of this coffin, we gain access to the final area of the game, God Home. God Home serves as the hub for the Pantheons, which are the four gauntlet-style boss rushes that we must complete, where you must defeat many, many, many bosses in a row with no breaks or benches to be found. So I start off by entering the very first one, Pantheon of the Master. This Pantheon is pretty easy and features mostly mini bosses like Vengeful Fly and Grub Mother, and also early game bosses like Gorb and the Dung Defender. With all my upgrades, I smash through this one, and even though I don't get breaks, any damage I can take can easily be healed up with a focus or two. That is, until I make it to the final challenge of the Pantheon, Nail Master Oro. A completely original boss just for this Pantheon. Is that it? Oh. Yeah. What? Yeah, so... I have to fight the Nail Master? That's kind of cool. Oh my god. Okay. Okay, I think I understand his pattern. This is really cool, actually. Oh, that was it? Oh my god, his bro! Is the painter gonna roll through? Yeah, so... Oh my god, they're brothers! Both of them now. Oh my god, I was like, that was way too easy. Oh my god, he's they're using our techniques, I just realized. That's pretty cool. Or the techniques that they taught us, I should say. And while I've never seen them before, I'm able to figure out their pattern pretty quickly. And once I take out one, the other ones go down even easier. And with that, I've completed my very first Pantheon on my first try. Now onto the second Pantheon, the Pantheon of the Artist. This one features more medium level difficulty boss, like the Mantis Lord, Soul Guardian, Nas. Look, you've already seen me fight all these guys, so I won't go through them one by one. Just know that the combination of unbreakable strength with quick slash allows me to shred through most of them in mere seconds. And if you couldn't tell by the name, the final challenge for this Pantheon is Nail Master Shio. He is definitely more difficult than his brothers, as his paint gives him a projectile that fires from way across the screen. Irregardless, I'm able to defeat him with little issue. Now it's on to Pantheon of the Sea. This arena features bosses that are a considerable jump in difficulty from the last one, with bosses like Hive Knight, God Tamer, Grim Fandango, Hornet. While I was able to take on all these bosses alone fine, now I'm usually starting each fight missing more than a few masks, which means I die more than a couple times. The fight that gives me the most trouble is definitely Umu, as I forgot to tell you guys, but like Quirrell like definitely died, so he's no longer here to stun the boss. Instead, you have to aim these giant jellyfish bombs to hit Umu, and getting the right angle can be really difficult. But after beating Hornet, it's on to the final challenge of this pantheon. What? You're- you're joking! What do you mean, Great Nail Sage Sly? What's going on? I mean, I know he had the nail art badge, but what- what's going on? What is this? What, what's going on right now? And Sly is definitely deserving of that title because this is a tough fight. He attacks at insane speeds. Like the second he finishes attack, he just starts another one. He's just always nimbly jolting around the entire arena, making it really hard to tell where he's coming from. But I just barely managed to claw some hits in until... Uh, Nords! You're joking. Seriously? Oh no, it's his face too. Uh oh. That's the worst thing that could have happened. <laughs> That's the worst thing that could have ever happened. Yeah. Oh my god, Sly's got the moves, man. I managed to get all the way through the Pantheon a few more times, but every single time, no matter how healthy I am, Sly just obliterates me. Eventually, I discovered that if you go into this room in the basement, you can practice any boss. And I spend a good amount of time while practicing Sly until I can not only kill him, but consistently kill him. Then, after an hour of pure Sly practice, I finally feel ready to take on the Pantheon again. I blast through, but due to a particularly troublesome Hornet fight, I go in too weak, die, and need to try again. The very next time, though, I managed to enter the fight with plenty of resources. And after an hour of training, I realized that the key to this fight is don't get hit. You also want to make sure to have as many hearts as you can going to Sly's second phase. Because A, you will absolutely not be able to heal during this phase, and B, you need to rush through him as fast as possible, otherwise you're going to die. So you need to hemorrhage as much health as you can, and then just spam quick slashes. Oh, you're facing the wrong way, you idiot. Yes! Oh my god! Yes! Yes, bow to me. Yes. Oh my god. Nice. Woo! 
That was a toughie. For completing all three pantheons, we unlock the final challenge for 112%, the Pantheon of the Night. This one features every single rage-inducing, soul-sucking, life-draining boss that I've hated throughout this run. Enraged Guardian, Lost Kin, Traitor Lord, Failed Champion, Soul Tyrant, you hate it, it's here. But somehow, in my 25 hours in this playthrough, I actually learned something, because I am tactfully flying through every single boss, and oh my god, am I gonna do this on my first attempt? And just like that, with full health i head into the final boss of this pantheon pure vessel okay what the what, what's going on oh my god what what's going on what is this what i'm five seconds what the heck what the what was i what even it's just experience well i'm gonna go practice that are you joking what even was that boom 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 i'm dead meet pure vessel and if you couldn't tell from that last clip he is hard and not just like hollow knight hard like if this is the relative difficulty of hollow knight bosses pure vessel is up here like i'm not sure i can even express to you how difficult this fight is with words like look at this clip you're watching right now i last a total of 20 seconds and get barely any hits off and this is after two hours of practicing that was the entire fight his attacks come out absurdly fast he does two damage with every hit so many of his attacks look the same so it's hard to tell what he's about to do if you even messed up once you get chained and take three hits in a row and to top it all off you cannot heal in this fight and believe you me i tried this is not just the hardest challenge in hollow knight this genuinely might be the hardest thing i've done in any video game ever second hardest thing i've done in any video game ever i sit there and practice for hours upon hours i lose time and time and time again for over three hours without a single win i look up some strategies online and people suggested using the charm sharp shadow which surprised me as i haven't thought about this in my entire hollow knight career what the charm says it does is make your shade dash do damage but it has a hidden benefit of making your shade dash actually much longer this makes it easier to dodge a lot of pure vessels attacks as his body hitbox is just huge with this after another hour of grinding i I managed to start making progress. I ended up turning off the music so I could hear his attack sounds, which just makes everything sound so incredibly eerie. He's only got five real attacks, so as long as you have a strategy to avoid them, you can get into a little bit of rhythm. That is, until he goes under 25% of health, when for some reason, he gains a completely new one. When he unleashes these freaking void tentacles. Not only is his attack incredibly hard to avoid, the way you avoid it is also unlike any of his other attacks. This void attack probably single-handedly caused 30% of my death. But finally, after five hours of grinding, something amazing happens. Are you serious? Yes, please. Is this a joke? Is this real? Is this real? Is this freaking... Oh my god. Oh, yes. Yes. And you know why I won? Because he never used a tentral attack. That's literally the only reason I won. You just got to save your soul for the end and just spam so he can't use a tendril attack. Oh my god. Okay. I want to be able to do it like three times in a row before I go. After some more grinding, I managed to achieve my goal of beating Pure Vessel three times in a row. But by the time I get through the Pantheon, he just absolutely destroys me. And when I go back to my practice, I'm no longer able to consistently kill him. Four more hours go by. And while I'm able to get a kill here and there, it's just not consistent. He's too freaking hard. So I decide something. I'm just going to go to the Pantheon. The chance of me getting it is so low that I don't think all the practice in the world is going to help me. I should just be trying this in the Pantheon, even though it's gonna each attempt is going to take like 10 extra minutes. I'd rather just be trying it there rather than just try 10,000 attempts here. I can, I can probably get to the vessel without too much trouble. But the Pantheon is no walk in itself, and since I changed my charms, I ended up dying several times to the other bosses. And even if I do make it to the vessel, the fight is usually like 10 seconds long. Oh god! But after hours, and hours, and hours of attempts... Yes! Yes! Oh my god, yes! Holy crap! Yes! Oh my god! Yes! Oh my god, I'm finally done! I'm finally done! Oh my god! Yes! 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 Oh my god, I can't believe I just got it! Oh my god, I'm gonna cry! That took so long! Oh my god! Oh my freaking god, that took so long! That is 112% completion of Hollow Knight. Oh my god. 
I am so tired. Honestly, this was not that bad. Not even until God mode or uh, whatever this mode is called. It, it was only bad until the pure vessel. And while yes, that is 112% true completion, there's one thing I'd like to do before we finish, and that's take on the game's true final boss. We head to the Temple of the Black Egg. We can easily take out the Hollow Knight. Then Hornet comes in and stuns him, allowing us to dream nail into his head and take on the source of Hollow Nest's infection. What the heck is that? The Radiance? Yeah, uh, this is hard. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. But coming off a of pure vessel, it's not even a drop in the bucket. As you're given way more opportunities to heal. And after 30 minutes of attempts... Please let this be the end. Really? Please. Please. Please, man. The Hollow Knight's gonna... He's gonna beat the crap out of the Radiance, I guess? Wait, what am I doing? Oh no, we're going into our shade forms and we're beating the crap out of them. Good. Bro, I'm gonna go all ethereal ghost on you. <gasps> oh, yes, all the infection's going away. Oh, we healed Hollow Nest. Yay. Wait, is that Hornet? The Hollow Knight and the Knight died. No. Oh, that's sad. What's in left? <gasps> She's still okay, though. Aww. The Knight. No. Oh. No, I'm chilling with all my siblings. Down in the abyss. That's not that sad. Pure completion. Achieve 112% game completion and finish the game. And that was 112% of Hollow Knight. If you made it this far in the video, let me know what game you'd like me to 100% next. Bye!